Okay, thank you very much, all of you, for being here, those of you who are here face to face, and those of you who are following us online from your homes or wherever. It's a privilege for us from the section of emergency psychologists to have someone like Muli Lahat here with us. He came here in 2018 after the facts of October and he was talking about the confrontations and uh, um, what we could experience in similar situations. And when we got in touch with him so that he could come here, uh, to COP uh, was uh, before the war between Russia and Ukraine was declared. And I know that he's been very involved in contents, in giving support uh, from people from all over the world uh, related to this war conflict. And uh, he, yes, this is a universal weird world we're in. I remember that he was giving support to, to uh, the terrorist attacks in Paris in 2015 to the Jew community in France at that time. And uh, when there was COVID, we got in touch uh, with uh, him uh, to see uh, what we could do, he was more used to acute stress and uh, this was different because it was an episode that had started and we didn't know how it would finish. And uh, the uh, emergency managers, we didn't know how to tackle this politically and also us professionals, we didn't know how to react because this was like uh, a long race. It was a totally new situation for us. So we got in touch with him and as always he was more than generous uh, sharing reflections, materials, etc. Muli Lahat comes here in Barcelona because he's invited to organize a workshop in the next two days and uh, uh, he uh, always uh, agrees uh, to everything we uh, ask him to do. And then we told him, if you come the day before, could you do a speech? And he said, yes, of course. And that's why he's here. So that's it, uh, enough from me. But I just want to say that one of the things I like about Muli Lahat is his ability to get to the nuclear part, to the core. Less is more. Uh, we need to try and measure well our interventions and trust the capacity of people and we need to be able to touch on the right buttons on people, apply psychology. So please enjoy and ask lots of questions. Thank you very much, Muli. Yes, okay. Uh, now I hear myself also, so I don't need myself to be translated to myself. <laughs> Uh, I'm sitting because I just need to make sure that I am talking on the right slide that you see. Otherwise, I'm confused and uh, it's not so good to be confused when you're talking to an audience. So good evening, Barcelona. Good evening to everyone. Uh, it is the second time I'm in this beautiful uh, place, but I understand that it was completely renovated lately. So I con congratulate you. Uh, I'm still a bit sad that uh, so many people are still uh, hooked to the Zoom and they prefer to be uh, in the virtual reality or in what I would call later a bit fantastic reality than in our uh, audience. But I understand that it is a way to be in touch with things nowadays and not to miss on things. And I believe that um, they will have their own way of understanding. Uh, perhaps when we come to questions, they might also be able to ask uh, questions uh, maybe on, on chat and I will try to respond, okay? But you are my audience, okay? I am referring to you as my audience, okay? So uh, just to, I understand that uh, Jordi, you gave some, some introduction and I am very happy to be again in your uh, organization here in your uh, office. 
Um, and uh, this time I will speak about something that is very close to my heart, which is um, the healing power of imagination. And uh, definitely in light of what have happened to us during the last two years, that some of us were completely enclosed at home and isolated from people. And probably one of the last things that we had in our hands that no one could control was our imagination, our fantasy, our ability to go beyond reality because reality was rather gleam, I should say, grim and gloomy. Okay, so we're going to uh, do what I am planning is kind of a straightforward lecture with few um, short videos. Um, the videos are of course in English, but they have subtitles and I hope the uh, interpreter will be able to follow the main thing. It's not very complex uh, uh, videos and they are very short. So without further ado, I will start by showing you uh, and I'm now trying to do this coordinating All right, so now, oh my God, I hear myself now. <laughs> okay, welcome world, yes, hello. Okay, so I'm actually talking about a very interesting subject for me, which is the healing power of imagination. And I will try to uh, cover both neurological side, psychological side, anthropological side to see how that fits in uh, what I would say the um, possible healing of traumas and other mental troubles, but mostly traumas, when you feel that everything is frozen, everything is uh, uh, un unchangeable, etc. Okay, so this is the the the, the name of, of my lecture, and I would like to go back. And usually, I like to take like a perspective and the perspective I'm going to take is very short, of course, but long in time and basically say that imagination was uh, not uh, a part of science and probably it is it, it was taken away from science, although we know that the most interesting findings of science were based on dreams or on, I would say, uh, insights of the, the, the people who uh, uh, invented them, but altogether, the car was somehow uh, uh, looking into this idea that there, or actually um, um, made it very clear that we have to differentiate between the, the body and mind, the soul and the body, the spirit and, and, and the body. And, and what happened there is that it says there is something that is concrete, something that you can prove, and the rest is nothing. The rest is imagination. The rest is fantasy. Historically, we can understand that it was a major point in trying to convince uh, the, the time, the of the time, that um, science has to be something that is proven, something that is concrete, something that is clear. But we lost so much as a result of it. And nowadays, we are in an era where we know that mind and body are very, very close together, but still you will see a, a lot of people splitting between uh, the two. Now, one of the interesting uh, uh, outcomes of that is what happened with medicine, because you see the whole concept of placebo actually says um, there is a, something that is nothing, there is nothing in it, and there is something that there is a potent in it, like a medicine or any other chemical. And if uh, that thing is not working, uh, I mean, if, if you give the placebo to a person and they react as if they are uh, getting the medicine, then within 32% uh, impact on the control group, the study or the research stops. Now, basically, uh, nowadays, we should all be very thankful to the uh, pharmaceutical uh, world. But what I'm concerned is that there are hundreds and hundreds of studies every year done in the world that basically show the impact or the powerful or the healing power of imagination. The ability of humans to take something that has, especially uh, uh, specifically from scientific point of view, nothing in it, 
okay? And get better. And very much so in our field of psychology. We know that in depression, we know that in anxiety, we know in many what we may call psychosomatic uh, uh, problems, the fact that you're getting something is helping you to feel better. Now, it's interesting because the term placebo is to um, uh, be placid to someone, to find someone, to, to please someone. Now, in the past, we were always thinking that it was the job or, or the, the role of the patient to please the doctor. But in recent years, it's also many times the doctors who are trying to please their clients or patients by giving them medication they don't need. You know, you have virus and you get antibiotics. Just the doctor can't really have this pressure of, of the client. So, you know, to please them. But I think it's not about pleasing at all. Before we had uh, uh, brain scans, we could think about only the psychosocial and emotional thing between a person and their healer, the doctor. But nowadays that we have uh, uh, PET scans and, and CT and all the MRIs, functional MRIs mostly, we can see that once the person gets the placebo and we can say believe, imagine, get into this power, imaginative power, the same areas that should be activated by the medicine are actually activated by that, what we call the power of imagination. Now, I know that some people say, but this is about belief, this is about spirituality. You can have many, many words, but I'm trying to locate that part in our brain where in our brain something happens. And despite the fact that you have no uh, chemical or any other uh, uh, particle that comes to the to that area in the brain, you basically make that area that otherwise was not working suddenly functioning again. And it is said to say that most of these studies that are done worldwide every year, we know hardly nothing about their outcome because for commercial reasons, for financial reasons, for scientific reasons, so to speak, they are stopped. And so we don't see basically what could have been a, a, I would say, a major breakthrough in understanding how we heal ourselves. So you see, already in 1955, this idea of, uh, of using the, the uh, element of, uh, at a point of 35 to 37 impact on the placebo group, you stop the research. And so it is basically what we're still doing today. And it's very, very uh, uh, um, sad because I'm saying it again and again, so much knowledge, so much information we could have retrieved from that on the natural way of the brain or the person to heal himself or herself. Now, there are hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of studies already from the uh, uh, 20th century, and of course, from our times, I'm just giving you several uh, um, um, examples of that, of the impact that were done uh, and, and was studied in many, many uh, studies worldwide. And uh, as you can see, again, in our uh, area of psychology, it's the depress depressed patients who responded to placebo, showed change in blood flow in their brain that were similar <coughs> to those observed in, in patients who received and responded to antidepressants. So, um, and it's the same with pain and it's the same with very interesting non-psychological problems like angina pectoris. So what is happening there? What happens in our brain that is helping us whilst using this imaginal power to heal ourselves? Now, there are more, uh, 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 I would say, evidence to that. And this is to do with all uh, uh, kind of what we call the rhythms of the body. That means the blood pressure, um, the, uh, um, yeah, that's it, yeah. The, the, the blood pressure, the uh, uh, how to relax and all that. And how quickly, basically, we can use our imagination to reduce and alleviate these uh, um, situations. Now, it's interesting that the same element that usually makes people very, very frightened and very, very depressed and very aggravated, which is our imagination, can at the same time be the opposite, can reduce our stress, 
can help us to to uh, ma manage our blood pressure, can manage even uh, our control or help us in the uh, secretion of red cells. So here I come to one of the basic, um, I would say, statements. I'm taking a uh, not so popular in some places and yet very popular in other places point of view, which is the idea of homeopathy. Because what we actually say, same cues, same. So yes, if the problem is with your imagination, perhaps we should employ imagination to help you, okay? But we know that unfortunately, the most severe cases in psychotherapy, in, in psychiatry, are people who are suffering from what I would call the illness of their imagination. They are suffering from what they imagine, from what they, they uh, uh, fantasize and, and, and this becomes a daily uh, pain and, and trouble for them. But as you can see, there are many, many other uh, uh, aspects that we can control. We can control uh, this sense of coldness and, and, and heat. Uh, we can uh, um, even cure warts. I've been uh, seeing this method of, uh, you, you may call it self-hypnosis, but again, you're using something of the mind and with, with very specific uh, sentences that you say to yourself and to your ward, the ward disappear without any, any medications. Um, we can, of course, uh, uh, know about this idea that dentists can use um, guided imagery to stop bleeding of the gums. And of course, in all the area of sex and, and, and orgasm, we can uh, go back to uh, the idea of uh, fake it, fake it until you make it, which is partially using your imagination. So um, we can basically understand that this concept that body and mind are not connected and what is the bridge that actually connects them in my mind, it is what I would like to call the imagination. Now, we know about uh, other uh, uh, studies that shows that we can actually uh, uh, impact uh, blood cells attacking a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a neutrophil, which is a, a cellular response to inflammation. And with the imagination cure, we know that there are many methods that we will come to in a minute. Uh, of working with cancer patients and again using their imagination to alleviate pain, to uh, further their ability to um, uh, maintain or even maintain, I would say, well being and even have some uh, uh, moments of or times of remission. So I'm coming to a very old study that sometimes we keep forgetting how powerful it was. It is 1980. And Simonton and Simonton uh, were studying patients with cancer. And they had in their group 159 patients diagnosed with incurable and almost, I would say, terminal uh, uh, expectancy of life for these patients. So, and they did a follow up of, on these uh, uh, clients for two years. Now, of course, imagination as, as it is could, could not cure these people. But the outcome is very interesting because about one third of them, okay, one third of them were still alive after two years, despite the fact that they were not expected to live one year. And probably one thing that was a different uh, uh, contribution to their um, well being was the, the, the use of guided imagery and relaxation. And here you see 22% of them showed no evidence of cancer. You may call it miracle, you, can, uh, you may say it's sorcery, I don't know, but this is the fact of that very interesting study. And 20% were in remission. And about one third of those who, who uh, um, uh, survived were stabilized. So there is something there that we were blessed by the Almighty that we can activate but from my point of view, it's something that we sometimes take either for, for granted or we completely uh, ignore. So, of course, there are uh, many uh, uh, nowadays with, with brain imaging, you can see evidence that, uh, that just predicts or uh, that, that even when we just think about something of the future, 
uh, or that we see that same thing, the same areas, almost the same areas in our brain is working. We know that from the whole concept that was about, not, not anymore new, the whole concept of uh, uh, new, uh, mirror neurons or yeah, mirror neurons. Now, the idea of mirror neurons is very interesting because you see, the mirror neurons can tell you what is the action that will happen, okay? So I can predict that you're going to uh, li lift your hand, okay? But one thing that mi uh, 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 mirror neuron cannot tell you as a scientist, what will this hand do? Will it uh, give someone a punch? Will it caress someone? Will it hug someone? We can only predict the, what I call the action, but not the intention. And that's a very, very interesting idea of where is the soul? Where is the mind there? Okay, we, we, we know so much about the brain nowadays, but we know very little. Okay, so I would like to focus now on what I call when living hurts uh, and the use of imagination in impossible situation, okay? And I like to quote here, George Bernard Shaw, who says to us, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing and that's a very interesting thing because you see human are the play animal they are the animals who play uh from the very beginning all mammals by the way are playing before anything uh, i don't know how many of you saw the uh the movie during covid um uh, netflix showed this uh, movie about the um, what do you call it? The octopus? My teacher, the octopus. Have you seen that? Now, those, if you didn't, go and, and, and watch it. It's an amazing, amazing film. But what is amazing is that this very, very, I would say, primitive creature is also enjoying play. But when we're talking about mammals, all mammals start their journey on this planet first and foremost as playful entities. And we even dare to say that play precede culture before we start to socialize, to go through socialization and culturizing us as human beings, we, we are playing. It's interesting to know that somehow over the years, we stop playing or at least we are directed to stop being playful. Uh, the other name of that institute is called school because school doesn't really like you to be playful. They want you to sit quiet on your chair from the time you came in to the time they gave you a break and then back on your chair and less and less time to be playful. And the more you grow up in the system, the less you are allowed to be playful. And when I'm saying playful, it's not just to be in the, in the yard and play games. It is to draw and to play music and to do drama and to read poems and books and write yourself. All these activities that I would call in general, not very specific, I would say, but still it is uh, commonly agreed to use it, the right hemisphere functions of the brain. We don't really pay too much attention to that part uh, for various reasons. And I believe it is mostly to do with the fact that it is very difficult to measure what's going on when you are fantasizing or imagining. Now you see that there is one term that we use always called daydreaming. Now, what is daydreaming? Is it images that we see or are they thoughts that we thought or are the concern that you are now hearing is, well, did I, did I turn off the gas or not? Is it daydreaming? When I'm talking to you, suddenly you go somewhere and you have a, a flow of, of ideas. Is that daydreaming? All of these are daydreaming. And that's why it's so difficult to test and examine that part of the brain. Um, I would even say, they're saying, this is the place where we could say freedom is still in our system. Because this is the only thing that even if we close you in a room and or you are in, in, in the jail, you, this part you we can't control. So 
it's interesting to know that um, we have to, to ask ourselves, so how can we employ, how can we use it in the service of therapy? Okay, so here I'm going to challenge uh, Maslow. Maslow actually, okay, why, why is it not moving? No, 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 okay. Okay, here it is. Here is I'm going to uh, challenge Maslow because you see, Maslow was looking at the uh, hierarchy of, of needs and said that creativity, morality, spontaneity, all that are at the very top. Okay, and what is at the bottom, at the basis? Of course, it's the physiological thing, the need to breathe, the needs for food, water, sex, sleep, etc. What is the next one? Safety, security, body, employment, etc. And if you can see, I put at the side the caveman time, and then only say, well, only when you are getting on in the development of, of human mind, etc., you are basically getting to the full fulfillment of your needs, of your um, uh, necessities. Now, if that is true, my question is, how come? we have these because these images are about 30,000 years old and they were made when we were very very endangered species um, we hardly had language at that time and we lived in caves and these images that some of them are not far away from here in north spain in south france and it goes all the way until to the uh, to Georgia, uh, we have caves with this with these um, images, and the question is, why waste time decorating something in times where everything is about survival? Because cavemen were very very uh, uh, scared all the time by their environment. Okay, now just just let's see uh, what are the 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 things that are that are part of this element. You need to take the fire because most of these drawings are at the bottom of caves. Have you been to any of these caves? You did? So the entry is very, very narrow and you go into a dark space. Now, there wasn't electricity, so they had to take fire with them. But fire was very basic and very scarce and very, I would say, um, um, pre precious, because it was very difficult to make it. It was very difficult to maintain it. It was very important for survival, warmth, protection, food, and all the ceremonies. So at the time that these people had to survive and all the little tribe had to be, I would say, engaged in survival, in going for hunting, in gathering things. You can't take a day off as an artist. Well, I want to go to do my, my, my drawing now. Imagine, it's, we need every hand in order to, to uh, uh, get a big mammoth and, and have food for the rest of the winter. But still they allow these people to go down into these caves, use the sacred fire, waste it for what? Now, my claim is that it wasn't for war. It was a very basic need. We need to express ourselves through imagination. We need to express, to show things that are beyond the concrete. It has a very, very important, important uh, uh, response to a very basic need. So let's, let's look at, at where these this, uh, uh, drawings were made. They were all made at the bottom of a distant cave Many a times a narrow passage, dark space where the sacred and scarce fire was needed. Okay, so they had to get permission to go there. They couldn't sneak with a little fire or, or something. And they drew many subjects. In fact, in some of the caves, you have 2,000 drawings, 2,000. So there was something that was a need. Now, what is it for? why they wasted the time, the precious time to maybe uh, uh, take some rest or sleep and recover to go on hunting the next day. Why did they do it? So we don't have a real 
uh, uh, answer, but we can assume based on our experience. And the first, of course, is to control anx anxiety and anxiousness. Why? We know that in therapy, when we're working with very anxious people, especially when you're talking about kids, you ask them to draw the frightening thing. And by drawing that frightening thing, that fear, they suddenly have a control on it. They can expand it and make a small monster into something huge and then make it small or, or tear it or burn it or smear it with black or anything. But the fact of creation is helping them to reduce their anxiety. We also know from uh, anthropological studies that in some uh, tribes in Africa, as part of the um, maturation, as part of coming to age, as they call it, um, the young man has to go and hunt a vicious animal, okay? Now, they are getting a dagger, a small uh, knife, uh, only something to cover uh, their intimate parts. And they are, of course, without any other cover. But in addition, they have a bandana, you know, a band here with a drawing of that animal. Now, coming back to your profession, if you would say that they are now imagining that by having this animal, they can control that other vicious animal in the, in the real world, we may call it dissociation, right? They imagine and then they, they are in some kind of uh, um, dis distance from reality. If that would have been the case, I would say that almost none of them would come back alive after trying to bring a vicious animal, an animal as a show of their ability to become men or belong to the manhood group. So what is that ceremony of putting that bandana, that, that bandage with an with a, with a, uh, animal that they are going to hunt on their head? It's probably a mental preparation. So they feel that they are protected and they feel they are ready to meet that amazing challenge. We have lots of other uh, assumptions, but I would say one of the very uh, clear one is probably it was rituals, either to tell the group story or to make sure that the group will remember the, how, how successful they were, or it was a kind of a worship which we don't really uh, know. But, but why? Why and what do we all fear the most? Of course, uh, we fear death and darkness. I should say they're almost identical. So we need to remember that we are fearing the most fearful thing that we're all sure about, and that at one day we will not be. Um, we don't uh, pay attention to it all the time. Otherwise, probably we would be in, uh, in a very, very bad shape. Uh, because we felt that there is no way to control it, of course, and, and, and it's like a burdening question. But I would like to ask you a question. Suppose there was no limit to our life. Suppose we will never die. What would happen to you? Imagine. There is no death. Death disappeared from the face of Earth. Can human think about that phenomenon? Would that make any difference? Of course, for instance, you wouldn't come here tonight because who cares to listen to something when uh, you can do it tomorrow, in 100 years, in 200 years? I mean, it is a sad thing, but it basically imposes on us the need to ask ourselves, what do we do with the time we have here? And we, don't, we know we have, all of us have an expiry date. Now, that knowledge of expiry date is unique to human beings. Not that other animals, when they are attacked or threatened, they don't know that their life is at stake. But definitely, they don't know in the sense that a child at the age of three to seven already know that one day he will not be. Once they get the full concept of death, it is something that we know that is part of our destiny. 
Now, I'm sure that some of you know Melanie Klein. She was actually saying that the moment the baby comes out of the womb, which I sometimes say, if you wonder where was the Garden of Eden, it's basically our mother's womb because how come in all legends and talk and, 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 and fairy tales and myth in the world, there is a, a, a description of this place where you don't have to worry and you are care, uh, care, care, catered and everything is provided for you. Is it imagination? No, I think it's a very basic cell experience of every human being because we all grew in this, I would say heaven or it's this garden of Eden. But Melanie Klein says the moment you move out of it and you need to breathe on your own and you have to eat and you have to uh, uh, digest, then this very basic understanding of what she called the fear of death is surfacing and that's basically what we are very, very fearful. Now you see, animals have passed, that's for sure. And you can see that uh, this little dog with a black eye, you know, looking like that, it's probably frightened of an experience he had in the past of like thunders or, or a big sound or something very, very frightening. And of course they have present, otherwise he wouldn't have been scared from this vicious other dog that is going to bite him. But what about future? Future for many animals is an instinct. For instance, for birds who migrate, for birds uh, uh, who, who build nests, but they are not concerned with what we may do. And you know, COVID was one of the major, I would say, uh, um, um, demonstrations of, of that uh, understanding that suddenly the fear of death was the agenda. We, we invest so much money, so, sorry, sorry, no money, so much energy, so much time to divert our attention from that fact that we are, uh, I would say, dispensable or, or uh, expiry type of being. And suddenly COVID brought it every day to the table. And not as only for all people, but for everyone. So suddenly we were very, very much in, confronted by it. But on the whole, we try on the very uh, everyday basis to push it aside. It's not that it is not in our head, as I said, if we don't have that idea that one day we will not be, we wouldn't have motivation, we would invent anything, we would have just lived perhaps like all the animals in the Garden of Eden. You know, the Bible actually says that um, they were all very, very happy. And, and Adam and Eve, before they were uh, ex expelled from the Garden of Eden, uh, they, they actually were just like the animals. They maintained their, their place and all that. And some people, and I belong to them, actually says that the fact that the primal scene of, of Eve was a blessing to us because she made us uh, human beings. Now, of course, we were born somehow, but have she not ate from the apple of knowledge and, and, and life, or actually uh, knowledge, sorry, um, we wouldn't have been in the position that we are as human beings to make choices. And as we know, we need to make choices because, because our, we have an expiry time, expiration time. Okay, so after being philosophical, let's, let's go and, and see what I mean here. Now you see, the only animal that have future in the sense of knowledge and that future includes the finality is of course this very, very delicate one in the center. Although the others are also mammals, but he, this, she knows that one day we will not be. Now, the question of course is um, why do children need imagination? There are many, many ways to look at it, but um, it is properly, I would say, something that helps them to slowly, slowly make sense of life. Uh, there are many, many theoreticians on play of childhood, uh, including uh, the very famous Eric Erickson, who said that uh, play is the auto therapy of childhood. Um, but you see, uh, we, we know that uh, developing the ability for normal cognitive uh, ability, uh, operations is part of, of our imagination, like taking the role of others, 
make believe, playing situation that probably prepares us for future, uh, increase our, of competency, sorry, of complexity and wealth of verbal ability because imagination adds words. It's very interesting to see when young kids are, are acquiring the language, they invent words. Sometimes the words are basically nouns, they turn into verbs or verbs that turn into nouns because they understand there is a need to explain that. So you see, um, I, 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 the, the example is coming, of course, of course, of course, from Hebrew. But the idea is that um, uh, when a dog is waking their tail, the term in English is to wake. I don't know in Spanish, but the child says he is tailing his tail because he thought, oh, if he's moving the tail, it has to be connected to the very noun. I mean, they invent, they, they, that's how they develop their language, of course. And um, it's giving a, a, a sense of independence and the ability to distinguish between reality and fantasy. And that's a very important message because somehow uh, in developmental psychology, we kind of support a message that young children don't really know to differentiate between fantasy and reality. Now, I would like to say that with my rather long experience, I would like to reframe and say young children knows very well how to differentiate between fantasy and reality, but they can't, it, it doesn't really matter to them because they are moving very, very easily between the two realms. What happened is that once they go to the education system, that wall is built and there is fantasy and it's out of class and there is reality and cognitive and all the achievement measurable achievement that are in the class and there are some studies that suggest that it is also to do with the development of our neocortex that means that uh, the more we mature the less we are able to fantasize and i would say Probably not, and I will. I'll try to, of course, convince you about it. Um, but very interesting is that uh, a question that comes very often, and that's about the uh, uh, magical friends, imaginary friends. Now, um, for years and years, I'm working with um, with school uh, therapists and all sorts of therapists who work in the school system, art therapists, drama therapists, music therapists, and of course, psychologists. And they are very, very concerned with a child at the age of nine or even a bit younger, but definitely older, is still talking about this imaginative friend. Now, there is a kind of a consensus, which of course I am in complete disagreement with, that children who have trouble has these imaginative uh, friends. Now, of course, as I said, imagination is also part or, or a significant uh, uh, a sign of, of, this, of a need or a despair of something. But most children who have imaginative friends do not have any em emotional or, or psychological problem. On the contrary, we know that um, these friends many a times are actually helping this child to develop their empathy because these children has to all the time consider what that other wants to do and learn how to negotiate. Interestingly enough, when they measured the ability to be creative of kids with imaginative friends and those without imaginative friends, there was no much difference. And very interestingly too, is that most of these children knows that this uh, friend is non-existent, but still they will refer to him or to it as something that is there. So. It's, they will talk about, if they would share it with you, uh, about their imaginative friend and what they want, what they do, da, da, da. But when you ask them, but is it real? They will tell you immediately not. But at the same time, they will tell you, but I'm continuously in dialogue or, or in friendship. So some of us will say, well, this is probably a lonely child. Maybe. But in many cases, it's not a lonely child. It's a very creative and imaginative child. So um, let's see where we're going with it. Yeah, that gives us a kind of a first step in my mind to go even more deeper to us, psychologists, mental health professionals. 
because we also contribute to the fear of imagination. And we did it by fr framing the uh, reaction to imagination with terms that are basically have a negative connotation. And that is the following. You see, we are de describing imagination in the following terms, fantasy, delusion, hallucination, illusion, dissociation, fiction, denial. Now, I believe that when you write your reports and you write that this person has auditory hallucination, you don't write before it amazingly beautiful, very intriguing and clever hallucinations. No, we usually, when we use that, we use it to describe pathology, okay? Now, that is a big question because are they all pathological or they are on a continuum? But once you refer to it in your report or in your dialogue with colleagues, usually you describe it as something that is at least no good uh, or, or need to be changed or something is not functioning with that person. Now, I want to share with you, I'm sure you all know that Anna Freud, when she coined many of these uh, uh, defense mechanisms, she wasn't at all looking at them as a negative thing. She was trying to describe something about the person's uh, meeting, I would call it meeting the world. But along the time, it even became sometimes a derogative. People are cursing each other uh, 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 with this kind of, of, uh, of terms like you are you are hallucinating or you are whatever. I mean, all these negative ways to use patho uh, uh, psychological, uh, I, I would say, um, um, personality uh, definitions or descriptions. Now, I want to say because we don't have many words in psychology that are actually saying imagination is good. One of them is, of course, creativity. Um, but just think about it, how many words we have to describe what is wrong with imagination, how very few words we have, because the, most, the moment you say fanta fantasizing, you mean to say, oh, something is wrong with them. Even fantasy is not, it's not something that we uh, keep clear of any um, negativity, so to speak. And I think it is a way for us to, to, sh to show that just like in medicine, we are afraid of, of, of imagination because we can't explain how placebo works. And just like with, with the, the reaction to children that are using imagination and we don't know what to do with it, we are afraid of it, we want to somehow control it. And the same for us, this is, I would say in general, a perception of uh, uh, the, the, the uh, I would say the Western culture in, in general. Uh, just let me see if, we're, yes. And of course, we can all go to our big father and claim that there is something wrong there. Although, uh, because Freud, Freud was basically trying to find what's going on, what is neurosis? And he was trying basically in the beginning to find the neurological, uh, uh, I would say, per, uh, um, um, definition or, or roots of, of, of neurosis. Once he couldn't find that, he actually uh, um, called neurosis the sickness of, of the fantasy. Not only that, he was very uh, uh, much working with dreams, of course, and making his fame on dreams, but altogether he used to look at this as a primary language and is probably been through training of that or the other we are actually trying to bring the, the, the client from primary language to secondary language, the more ego language, the more self language, rather than to the instinctual language, which is the primary language. Now, um, there is a, a, um, uh, uh, some quote from him uh, on, from five lectures on psychoanalysis that he says, the energetic man is one who successfully by his efforts in turning his wishful fantasies into reality. Whereas the artist can transform his uh, fantasies into artistic creations instead of into symptoms. The doom of neurosis, which means he actually describes what happened to the, let's say, mature personality, 
to the less mature personality and to those who are still stuck with uh, neurosis. Um, and um, it even actually helps to, to look at this from a critical point of view. And I don't think that Freud was against imagination and against fantasy, but what happened that once he also looked at, or, or actually referred to imagination in a critical way, we interpreted it as a negative way, as that something is wrong with the imagination. We have to uh, wish for the mature personality to move away from daydreaming, to move away from fantasy, to be grounded, to be uh, in the present. Okay, so a little bit on that too, and let me see. Um, but what do we do? What do we know about daydreaming actually? There is a very old study that was done with um, what? You, uh, hold on, with uh, um, bereaved people. Yes, that's what I want to, to look into. It. Yeah, uh, this this study was uh, to start with was done with normal population, and uh, they asked how much normal people daydream. And they found out that 50% of the awakening time, 25% about objects, and 50% was were imagining talking to another person and hearing voices. Now, look, it's 1995. It's before we had cell phone and so many people were walking in the street with this uh, earphone and talking to themselves out loud. So at that time, when someone was talking to himself outside or, or, or uh, reporting that he was talking out loud was a something that we focus on. Altogether, the next phase of this study was very interesting. He actually uh, interviewed bereaved, uh, mostly women, but also men and asked them about their daydreams. And all of them said, that if they daydream about their loved one who is not with them anymore, it's a moment of uh, of reassurance, of calmness, of happiness, not of, of despair. And the, the other study they did is on immigrants, or what we now call refugees. And they realized that immigrants or refugees, when they come to the, to the new place, some of them find that if they can find a point in the area, in the vicinity, when they concentrate, they transport it, they move to as if they are at home. These moments of, what we say daydreaming of or dissociative moments are the moments they feel very good rather than very bad. It's like the mind is, is curing itself by imagining, by being for a moment in this bubble, in this bubble where they can imagine they are not so far away from their loved ones and from what is so important for them. So basically, nowadays we, we realize that daydreaming is a very important, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, preventive or even, of course, coping me uh, 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 mechanism. Now, I would like to go for a moment to my anthropological part of this lecture. And that is to share with you a very interesting study I don't know if this book was ever translated beyond uh, Hebrew, uh, maybe to English, uh, but I don't know if into Spanish. It is a Israeli psychiatrist who lived in Africa and tried to use uh, modern Western medicine on Africans with what we may call psychopathologies. To his amazement, he realized that what he was doing with his medication was just deteriorate the conditions of these tribes because the tribes were living in harmony with what we may call pathology with this imaginative fantasizing this the, the, uh, delusional leaders who were actually doing with that because their their survive their, their surrounding were able to um uh use these these images as as a spiritual experience once they stopped it with the medication not only that person, so to speak, reduced his or her fantasies, but what happened is that their tribe, the small clan, also was very, very negatively affected. Altogether, what he says to us in one of his, uh, in this book, is the following. During normal development of the child in the West, 
we expect the child to realize that they are imaginary, uh, those imaginary characters that we just talked about are not real and that the child should give up the belief that these creatures exist in reality. If the child in the West continues to envision and treat such characters as part of reality, even after a phase in which all his milk teeth have been uh, uh, replaced, in the West, in the good scenario, he will be uh, considered as being weird and in, 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 in best cases or in worst cases, a psychotic. What he actually says to us that it is part of our culture to say, stop it. There is no point in it. It's no good for you. You are not realistic. You are an astronaut. You are a fantasizer. You're a dreamer. You may be even some, someone who suffers from, from emotional uh, uh, problems. Now, what happens in other cultures? I would like to share with you some uh, uh, basic uh, uh, stories, but I would love uh, to, first of all, talk about or show you a short uh, video of how other cultures react to the most fearful thing that we all fear of, and that's our finality. So if Sonia can now show us the first video. Yeah. We don't hear it, but you can see that. And this is a funeral, of course. And look at how they are. Sonia, there is no sound. Probably you need to do it there too, but later on too. So you see they are dancing with a, with a coffin. Oh, she stopped it, maybe. She... Sí, anem a fer una altra prova, gràcies. She probably needs to... Booyah, yeah. heaven. They put the coffin as a bird. You will see now they are bringing it to the uh, graveyard. And look, they are dancing. Respected of everybody here in Teshi. So his funeral has to become as big as it was. The music and songs should cheer up the path to the cemetery. The more people sing and dance, the happier the deceased will be. No expense or noise should be spared. It is better to run into debt than to offend the deceased. This is Australia, the funeral.
sober, serious punishment. Thank you, Sonia. What I wanted to show you that the perception of coping with death and the concept of death is, is uh, uh, very different when we are talking about different culture, of course. Now, why did I uh, put it up? Because I believe that that really, uh, hold on, my other one isn't working. Uh, the dead is basically where our imagination is uh, uh, in extreme need. And I call it the impossible situation because when someone dear to you die, you wish to connect with them. And in our culture, it's very, very difficult if at all possible because we believe there is the alive world and the world of the dead and there is no connection. I mean, some of you probably have seen and maybe visited and been in Mexico in the um, Festival of Death. And uh, I've seen that the Mexicans are still maintaining this same concept that they actually every year, they do a festival of the death and they go to the, uh, to the cemetery and they uh, costume themselves as skeletons and they bring from home the ancestors' skull and they put cigar in their mouth and they feed them and they, and you ask them, what's going on? In fact, what I believe they can do, they can move between fantasy and reality. And with that, and we'll see that in a moment, probably deal with things that we are in the West are quite uh, unable to because we are so stuck in this very clear division between what is there and what is not, what is the in the reality and what is in our mind. But I would like to, to share with you uh, for one moment, a personal experience. Some of you have heard it before, but I love to tell this story because it's such a profound experience of mine many years ago. I was working in uh, Sri Lanka, eh, sorry, I was working, of course, in Sri Lanka, but this time I was working in Singapore. I was working in the only mental health hospitals on the island called Woodbridge. And I was supervising teams. I was supervising teams uh, of all wards, but I realized something very, very special in this hospital. You can be treated, of course, by psychiatrist medicine. You can have psychotherapy. You can have a social worker but they are an art therapist, but you can also call for a shaman, for a indigenous healer to come. Now, we had a woman that was admitted like two or three months earlier on, and she was in her late 60s, and she was very, very depressed, clinically depressed, couldn't really react to anything. She didn't respond well to medicine. She didn't respond to any attempt to do psychotherapy with her or anything. And um, at one point, uh, my, my supervisee uh, was working with her and she was trying to do something about arts or whatever, it wasn't very really successful. And one day she sees the family and they said to them, we are dismissing, we're taking uh, old, ma old mama, old uh, lady home. And, and she knew that this lady is in a very, very bad shape. So what's going on? So said, we brought the shaman, we brought the indigenous uh, healer, and he gave us a, a direction and we do that. And before they left, because they liked her, because she was so nice to this lady, they said, would you like to join us for the wedding of the dead? Now, my colleague was a very sensitive lady and she almost fainted when they said it, but she said, I will call my supervisor. And she called me and we said, of course, that's where we're going. We're going to the wedding of the dead. What do you mean? And here we come on a Sunday to the, uh, this beautiful uh, kind of uh, temple. And the first thing we notice is that the client, this old lady is standing next to the altar where there is a puppet of a doll, a doll, sorry, of a, a bride and a groom. 
and she's using the bells and she's greeting everyone. And next to her, of course, is the shaman, the, the spiritual healer. And everyone comes to this, what we now understand is the wedding, with the best of clothes and with the best of presents. Now, it's not a real car, but it's like a very, very good model made of uh, uh, paper or cardboard. And it is brought for the wedding. Now, the, the, the doors, of course, are going to get all the presents, including some very, very, uh, I would say, um, uh, real things like uh, Coca-Cola or whatever, Pepsi. And of course, they get some oil and paper money. So like everyone is coming ready for the wedding. Now, standing next to a young per person, we asked him, can you explain to us what's going on? And he says to us like this, he didn't know who we are for sure, but never mind. He said, you see this old lady there? Of course, we, we, we knew her, but we didn't say anything, of course. Uh, and he said, um, this is my mother-in-law. Many years ago, before my wife was born, she had a girl who died at the age of three. And in recent times, this girl, this baby girl who died is haunting her, doesn't give her a moment of sleep and she really got very, very bad. And of course, said so, and they couldn't help us in the hospital, da, 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 and nothing helped. And so we called this gentleman, this, this shaman, and he said to us and to her, listen, your daughter wants to marry. So let's go to the uh, community funeral book and see if there was a boy at the same time and we'll make this wedding. And that's where we were. That's exactly where we were. And uh, now at the hype of this ceremony everything is taken the uh, doors are put in a bed all the presents that you see all are now marching everyone the the, the mother the family the, of course the shaman the the doors all are proceeding into a big big yard where there is a big inferno huge inferno and everything is thrown into the fire and Whenever I tell this story, I can see the image again. This woman was glowing. She felt as if something, you know, we know we call it in psychotherapy, finishing an unfinished business. Now I called my colleague and I, I said to my colleague, please call the family, you know, in the three times, uh, uh, three months time to see how she is. And she did. And the woman was fine. Now what was there? We actually made the impossible possible. You see, she couldn't marry her daughter, of course, but we make this make belief and we all took part in it and she could finish an unfinished business and had something to do with the beyond. And that's, that's basically what we are, are talking about. Well, when we look at the outcome nowadays of, uh, um, what happened when we compare, and this is a very old study already, that shows psychopathology in our cultures versus non-industrial uh, uh, cultures, we see how uh, difficult uh, it is for, for, <clears throat> for us. You see, in the uh, non-Western countries, you have remission from uh, psychopathology, very serious psychopathology, psychotic remission, in 61% during these two years follow-up, and for us only 37%. And you can see more and more in remission almost twice as much. But I'm going back to this old lady because when you ask nowadays GPs, you know, family doctors, what is the most common um, problem that old people comes to you nowadays when they're talking about emotional side? It will be depression. Now, if you see the comparison in the West, it's 66% of the complaints, whereas in these other places, it is 3.5. And unfortunately, in the West, it also comes together with suicidal attempts and suicide. Whereas in this study of for two years, it, there wasn't one case of suicide amongst the elders. So what is it? What is it that makes it this difference? And the, the outcome, of course, is not that tomorrow morning we all have to put fire in the middle of the room and dance with, 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 with uh, uh, straw uh, um, uh, skirts. No, no. 
what we know is that there is this communal approach. There is the acceptance of imagination as part of life and the ability to solve things that are impossible to solve in reality by employing imagination and playfulness, which are the natural way that women, that, that human have been uh, helping ourselves, our uh, uh, being for generations and generations. Now, so I'm going to show you, oh, this is, this is the one I already showed you. So let's move to another part of our, okay. Um, so I'm now focusing in the last, um, it's what, uh, the third part of my lecture probably, is about post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the field I am most known as worldwide. And of course, in Israel, I'm, I'm, I've been working with post-traumatic stress disorder since 1974. So for those of you who are trying to see if I'm before Jesus was right, just after it, it's just somewhere in the middle between them. Uh, it's many years ago that I'm in the field of uh, helping people with post-trauma. And of course, the other side is looking at their ability to recover, which is resilience. Now, here again, uh, our studies showed us that people who have problems in reality or in, in uh, managing their life, some of them are going into the extreme part of fantasizing and they are completely disconnected to what we would call reality, okay? But we also can see evidence that people who may use imagination, use their playfulness and be able to use creativity may be able to help themselves. And I'll talk about it very soon. But before that, I want to show you two clips from, um, yeah, from our time of how people employ this idea of fantastic reality before I even start talking about what it is um, in times of COVID. So Sonia, please show us the first uh, COVID uh, clip. Yes, Corona! Thank you for coming, Chin Chin, Chin Chin, Chin Chin. Thank you, Chin Chin guys, Chin Chin, Chin Chin, Chin Chin. This is when we all were enclosed, you see? Okay, that's one example of how we use fantastic reality when we were so alone. And please show us the next one now. F, yes, this is it. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This is the captain speaking. Uh, just about ready to depart. Should be away on the So you see, in times of isolation, when the impossible is completely impossible, what could help us is just transcending into fantastic reality. And these are just few examples of, of, of that uh, um, idea, how our mind can find solution in impossible situation. You can chin chin with someone, you can dance with your mirror image, and you can imagine by uh, sitting next to your washing machine that you're actually landing somewhere. So it is the power of imagination that makes the impossible possible. That's what I wanted to share with these two uh, little clips. So what is it? What is this part in us human being that helps us? And that's the par part that we call the ability to be playful. Now, I, I saw that in some places you translated playful into game. And I'm not talking at, at all about the game, but this um, characteristics of human being to be playful. And that's why I would like to, to um, but maybe in, 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 in Catalan, you don't have a, a clear dis, dif, uh, differentiation, but 
I would like you to consider what I'm saying now. It's not about being able to do games, but to be playful. And be playful doesn't mean that you have to play. It could be only in your mind. You don't, do, you don't need to do anything practical. <clears throat> so playfulness is a term referring to a style or attitude. A person with playful attributes is governed by internal motivation, internal orientation, and is unbind to external rules, and is actively involved in his environment. Interestingly, if you're thinking about the term uh, internal locus of control, that is partially what this is meaning. That they are, of course, very much uh, in touch with um, their abilities, they are not uh, uh, surround, uh, uh, what do you call it? surrendering to rules, but at the same time, they want to be actively involved. So it's not, they're not withdrawn. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And it is interesting because it's both a characteristics and a behavior. It's not just one of them. So what do we know about playfulness? We know about playfulness and coping that, that are, there are self-directed processes that involve creative, multi-strategy approaches, persistence, active engagement, and flexibility, which is one of the um, most common uh, attributes of coping and resilience, and often produce positive effect, effect. Links have been made between play and coping terms of adaptability, to the, to the demands of the environment, exploration of options, creative problem solving, social competence, and internally driven motivations. All of these have been uh, found already in the previous century. But I would like to share with you some studies on the connection between playfulness and, <clears throat> and uh, coping. And you see, these are individuals who reported lower levels of perceived stress than their <clears throat> Sorry. And then their counterparts, they were more frequently utilizing adaptive stress-focused coping strategies, and they were less uh, likely to uh, employ negative, avoidant, and escape-oriented strategies. Although we say, ah, oh, they are fantasizing that they will do uh, avoidance behavior. No, not at all. Not at all. The playfulness is a motivation to meet things rather than to uh, withdraw. And um, what about PTSD? Hold on. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, we have we still have another another study. Sorry, I, 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 this one is is not in conjunction with that. This is about girls and boys, and you will see that this study showed that girls are far more playful and using playfulness in order to cope much more than boys. And this is a very very recent study we did in Israel with paramedics. We wanted to know if playfulness could be one of the protective factors when you go time and again to uh, uh, the very, very hard scenes of accidents, death, uh, 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 pain. And our study showed, and you can see it very, very clearly, that the most predictive uh, component of feeling resilient in continuously exposed to uh, very, very un unfortunate and very bad, sad, uh, horrendous sights is their uh, playfulness as, as, a, as a coping method and of course, as a trait. You see the paramedics who could utilize playfulness were much better on, on the scales of resilience. So I would say that there is enough material to, um, I think this is it. Uh, there is enough material to show to show us that, in fact, we can see the benefit of imagination, the benefit of fantasy, and the benefit of playfulness. So, what do I want to say here? Uh, let's see. You can read it yourself. You don't need it. I will. Uh, say it over and over again, but what is very important is the bottom line. And again, I'm not sure that you translate it to play, but maybe to, um, well, what happened to my computer? Hmm? Got it to be connected, what do you want? Sorry, I'm talking to my computer because that's how we uh, communicate and make things clear. 
Um, so basically, what I want to say is that uh, when we say play, we don't say games. We, they, we make, sure, make sure that I'm not sure if, if the translation here is correct, but I, I don't know your language, so I trust you. But anyway, what we found out that people with PTSD are finding very, very hard, if at all, to be playful. Because if you think about the position of being playful, it means <clears throat> I have to uh, go into a, a, a position of less control or less on guard. And for them to be on guard is very, very important because they cannot miss the next time that something may go wrong, like it was in the unexpected uh, uh, situation where they unfortunately were exposed to trauma and develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So we found out that people with PTSD are, find it very, very hard to play, very hard to imagine. They sometimes will say to you, I can't really go to a guided imagery or, re or relaxation because I, I can't, I'm just not good in, in imagining. Now, I want to say to you one very interesting thing. They, they are very good in, in imagining, but only negative imagination. They, they have all these memories that are, keep haunting them. And when they surface, they feel as if it is um, happening now. So they're imagining because it's something of the past. And I would call, in my way, a PTSD is the ailment of imagination because the imagination is stuck. It's not just cognitions. These are images. These are uh, uh, so, uh, <clears throat> um, sense of uh, uh, hearing, tasting, smelling. All of these are not cognitive parts that are part of this haunting and frozen memory. Okay, so because we found out that for these people to be playful is very, very difficult and uh, uh, threatening, we have come up with a method that slowly, slowly re-engaged them in a very slow and minute way with their ability to be playful. And for that, we're using cards, but that's a different ball uh, story, so I will, I will come to it maybe later. But what is important to, to no, uh, notice is that when we are uh, uh, in, this, in the face of trauma, as we all know, the frontal part, the prefrontal parts are not active or less active. And what is really active is all the other senses that are basically uh, moving into the survival mode because we need to be alert and to uh, this well. The function that has to start working for us is the uh, amygdala or the limbic system. And we need to be very clear about how do we uh, manage it and we manage it on instincts or immediacy and processing is coming much later. Perhaps that's the reason why we are so uh, um, happy or, or satisfied with CBT, because what happens, CBT is translating all those, so to speak, experiences into words and bringing back the control over the situation. Words are our way, uh, lists that the Lord gave us, that with words, we control the world. Um, that's probably what happens when we educate kids not to be uh, vicious, not to be aggressive. Uh, we actually teach them to talk their emotions rather than to act their emotions. But once we are under threat, we act our emotions because we have to survive. Now, what happened is that all these parts of the memories that are not verbal or not specifically verbal and definitely not cognitive are embedded in the moment of trauma. So CBD is translating it, but it can't really translate everything. We call it lost in translation. There are parts that are beyond words. As Bessel van der Kolk says, that trauma is terror beyond words. And basically we need to probably go into other directions in order to help the person to clear and manage these uh, 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 troubles. Um, so when the client can't talk, think and process trauma through superior brain functions that are unavailable to him because of the situation, of course, we need to use the available imaginary, imaginary resources 
which uh, that's what we are actually talking about. And as you can see, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, the, the brain functioning, the brain structure. But basically what we want to say that <clears throat> the, the prefrontal part of the cortex is definitely not the one that is operating in that moment. What is basically working is our survival kit that basically uh, looking for uh, signs of distress and moving us to the fight, flight, freeze. And, and that's very important, the hippocampus part, which means the part that says to us um, what we call the emotional memory. Uh, what about relationship? Or if you want to uh, go back to Bowlby, it's about the attachment. And perhaps that's the problem with PTSD, that we, all, we have trouble with our uh, fear instinct or the fear uh, uh, element and the attachment element. What I'm saying is that basically when we treat people with PTSD, we want to control two things. Their stress reaction, hyperarousal and all that. And that's relatively easy. We can do lots of conditioning. But what is very difficult is to work on the other memory, which is the emotional attachment memory, because many people who have been uh, uh, su subject to traumas and develop PTSD have lost their belief in humankind and in human kindness, especially nowadays. And that's a really, uh, Mark, I'm uh, uh, talking about, uh, maybe if you want to discuss it later, I'll talk about it. But we found out that betrayal is the most difficult part of PTSD for both rape victims and also for soldiers or, or military people. They feel that we have abandoned them, that we betray them. And that's a very, very serious part of the trauma. So the conditioning of, or deconditioning against their fear is good, but not good enough. Okay. So, um, talking about dissociation, we know that dissociation in times like this are sometimes the bliss of the moment. What actually helps these people to uh, manage the situation, we call it they transcend, they move away from the situation. However, there are studies and theoreticians who are very, very frightened of that moment where the mind is transporting you, taking you to this fantastic place or to this dissociative state. And the main fear is, of course, that we will develop a dissociative uh, personality. So what happened is that some time ago, actually in 2003, the American Association of Psychiatrists commissioned a group of very, very important and clever uh, researchers to try and find what are the main predictors, or I should say, yes, predictors of, of uh, that would predict development of PTSD. Uh, they did a um, critical study of 68 studies very, very interesting, very important, but the outcome was in a way detrimental to the whole concept of dissociation because they actually suggested that, listen, I'll do it slowly because we are late and it might confuse some people. 70% of people in the 68 controlled studies, 70% of these people who in hindsight uh, reported that they had dissociation in the very first period of time after the trauma developed PTSD. Again, in the acute stress reaction, the acute stress disorder, if they report in hindsight that they had dissociative elements, 70% of them later on were diagnosed with PTSD. So this is a very, very grave, I would say message to us to be aware and to be afraid of dissociation, of course, because it is kind of a, predict, a, a major predictor. Of course, it is a, something that we have to deal with. However, uh, what we also know is that when you talk to victims of trauma, many of them will basically tell you a very positive experience of their dissociative moments in the most horrendous times. For instance, prisoners of war, of war will uh, talk about 
uh, going into this bulb, uh, you know, I bubble it, I told you, uh, women who have been uh, in unfortunately situation of rape and um, talked about out of body experience, um, um, people who have uh, terminal ailments and are using what we talked about earlier on, imagination and, and, and guided imagery, Holocaust survivors who are talking about their ability to move to fantasy and um, also uh, bereaved parents who uh, lost their kids who are talking about their need to talk to their kids. They go to the graveyard and they talk to the grave and sometimes they even say we hear the grave talking back to us or the kids are responding to us. But as I, we already established for us in the, world, in the Western world, it's no good. You get, you're crazy because you don't dance with the dead. You don't speak to the dead. They are somewhere there. You're not there. They are there and you're here. And there is a very clear boundary. So looking at the cases in our clinic, we realize we have to look into what's going on. Why in the clinic, some of the clients with, with trauma will describe these moments as moments of bliss. Whereas in the literature, it appears to be a predictor of PTSD. And that is the last part of my lecture uh, where we did a comparative study on the use of uh, or the experience of near-death experience with uh, uh, people and compare them to those with PTSD. So what are the elements of near-death experience? It's out-of-body experience. <clears throat> it's, um, um, sorry, it's the floating. It's those people who talk about the tunnel with the light, uh, meeting spiritual figures, um, just light. And of course, my life passes in front of me like a movie, okay? So in fact, all of these are basically can be seen as peritraumatic dissociation because they've been experienced very, very near to the incident, okay? So the question was, would that, would that uh, basically predict what we are afraid of? And the outcome was that when we did this study with the near-death experiences, not a single one had post-traumatic stress disorder. So we thought, ah, so that's probably the protective factor. That means if you can dissociate in these ways, floating, light, da, 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 you won't develop PTSD. But to our amazement, it wasn't the case. Also, people with PTSD have the same experiences. They have seen their life as a movie. They are seeing the, the tunnel, the out of body and all of that. But what actually differentiate between the two groups, and that's very important to note, is that ph the phenomena of seeing life in front of me. Now, the other options, tunnel, out of body experience, or um, uh, characters, etc., are basically, I would say, um, experiences of imagination. Okay, you don't see people, you don't see, it, it, it's not something real. It's like transcending into fantasy. The only uh, dissociative moment that is somehow connected to reality is of course, I see my life in front of me. And when you see your life in front of you, you basically are aware of your death, your finality, your grieving of losing everyone you love. It's not a life review of the old person. It's something that you understand, this is the end. I'm going to either being killed or become crazy or whatever. And uh, we believe that this is where the main difference is between the two groups. Yes, there is a, what we call at-risk group of people that when they face grave situation, will use dissociation. Some of them will use more the fantastic part. As you can see, they will only use seven and a half percent of them will use the life as a movie. And some of them will use a lot of their life as movie, which is about 70%, as you can see on the graph. And they will probably get stuck because they can't really fulfill the full transcendence into this fantastic uh, <clears throat> realm and descend 
in reality with no symptoms. Now that's very important because what we actually say <clears throat> that that group of people, and we know that not everyone develops PTSD, <clears throat> is basically can use fantastic reality, but something happened in the process that stopped it. And that was probably the moment when they realized they are going to die. And so what happened in reality, or in fact, is that those who can move to this fantastic space for a time not really function well. But after a while, and if you will uh, interview a person who had a near-death experience, you will see that they like to talk about it very much, unlike people with PTSD who don't want to talk about it altogether, uh, that they are basically having a very positive experience from this movement, movement to this other fantastic space. Based on that, we decided perhaps we need to ask ourselves, how come in the same vulnerable group of people who have tendency to use imagination, we have people who have been able to use it in times of crisis and those who, who hadn't. And what we did, we just asked them questions about their childhood. We believed that something in their childhood might have been the reason for it. And what we asked them is, what were your recreational activities as a child? Not just what, but how often and for how many years? And as you can see here, the group of the fantasizers are much more, uh, 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 I would say, uh, were much more uh, using this recreational ability as children. Now, we can only assume one thing, either that it was their nature or it was the families that encouraged them to do it because it's out of school, or that that was basically the way to prepare the mind for moments where you have to transcend, to move away from the situation because they maintain their playfulness in them. We can't say it for sure, but we have this concept that perhaps that's what have happened. That's how they were able, because they belong to the same at risk group, but they did not develop PTSD. On the contrary, they, they were saved from it. So, hold on. Okay, so what actually we do in fantastic reality is that we are basically able to change the three main elements of reality. I will, I'm going to stop in a minute. Um, and these are, they, these are time, space, and role. You see, we in therapy are very much supportive or even uh, uh, determinant around the, the idea of time, space, and role. Uh, we all the time schedule the meeting with our clients at the same day, at the same time, at the same room, same uh, clinic. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we remember who is the patient, who is the therapist, of course, this is the role. Uh, we're so uh, uh, engaged with that, and that's part of what we call reality, is that now it is 20 to 8, and we are in this hall, I am the lecturer, you're the listeners and those in the, in the Zoom also listeners, etc. So we have very specific time, space and roles. Now you see we're so conscious about it in therapy that when the client is late, we say he's resisting, right? When he's early, we say he's anxious. Whereas when he's on time, he's, uh, um, uh, we call him that he's um, uh, OCD, you know, that he's over punctual. Okay, we were very, very critical about time. Uh, and of course the space, uh, you have a client who doesn't know that you have this sacred seat that you can do your sorcery only from that seat. And they, it's a nice seat, so they sit there and suddenly you come to your room and you see that your <laughs> sorcerer's seat is occupied. Not to mention that you don't know how to look at clients from this direction because you always look them this way. And the most fearful thing is what your supervisor will say to you about being able to keep your space and your boundaries. And of course, all the thing about role that we keep on talking about when we do supervision about our role and our transference and counterance and all that. So basically, we are very, very much focusing on that. But at the same time, all of us, or most of us are using the 
uh, I would say, the flexibility of this thing. Because when you ask your client to sit on the chair and be you and you will be him, or be his mother and you will be him, actually you're taking him to fantastic reality. Because at the end of the day, you are not his mother and he is not uh, his father or the empty chair is not someone who is not with them. And when they write letters to someone who has died, these letters will never be sent. But suddenly something happened to them and they feel that you've added, I would say metaphorically, in activation, the other 50% of their brain. So basically in fantastic reality, we can make changes to these very important three components. And we can basically uh, experiment with many, many things, uh, including roles they will never play, including uh, um, um, situations they will never be in or prepare them for them. They can express aggression without any impact because it's okay to use the bataka and hit the chair and, 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 and be very aggressive about something that in reality you can't do and hopefully you won't do it. And many, many other things that we are allowing because in this if space, all the ifs are possible. And that's what empowers the person. And that's what gives the person a sense. I can basically do something with the impossible. And mostly, as I said, with things that are not anymore with me. With that, guys, I am uh, going to uh, stop. But I want to take the last minute to show you the last clip. I will give you the basic of it. And with that, I will leave you time for questions. The story I'm going to, say, to tell you now, and I'm going to show you this movie, is a real story. This is an oh, about 80 years old lady. As a child, she was in Poland. Nowadays, Poland is in the, uh, of course, in news because of Ukraine. Hold on, hold on, not operated still. And uh, she uh, was taken with her family to hide in farmer's house somewhere in Poland. Uh, they were, of course, Jews, and they were fleeing from the Nazis. But someone actually uh, told the Gestapo where these people are hiding, and the soldiers came to find them and take them away. Now, when they arrived at this uh, barn where this uh, uh, Polish family hide them, uh, they couldn't find them because it's a big barn. And so they decided that the soldiers to burn the, 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 the barn, to just put it on fire. Now, the mother of this child knew German, so she went out of the hide and say, you don't need to do anything. I, I'm the only one here, and uh, that's it. You can take me. But she didn't stop there, and she starts to criticize them about their behavior. And of course, in the face of her daughter, who was, of course, hiding, but seeing all the scene, they killed her. And the husband, the father of the child, ran away to the forest and she stayed there and the family continued to hide her. Now they hired her in a barrel under the place where the cows were so that they will be, she will be there. And every lunchtime, one of the girls of the family used to come and give her food. Now this one and a half minute piece that I'm going to show you is what this girl was doing for a year and a half when she was hiding and never saw the light of a day. Sonia. אני שרתי את השירים שאימא ודניסה שרו לי, בליבי לא השמעתי קול. סיפרתי לעצמי סיפורים שהם סיפרו לי, עוד ועוד ועוד, כל פעם מחדש. כתבתי לעצמי סיפורים חדשים בתוך המוח, שאחר כך הייתי חוזרת עליהם. הייתי מספרת לעצמי על הילדה ש... שחוזרת הביתה, שפוגשת את פיפי הכלב שלה, שפוגשת את אימא. עולם שלם יצרתי לעצמי, וכך כל יום מחדש, 
כל יום עולם אחר. וכך הייתי שם, משהו כשנה וחצי, בחורף, בקיץ, בסתיו, ועוד פעם אביב. ולי זה נראה כמו כל החיים שלי.